Thanks again, Alison, for just having a chat with us today about your brand new two day training course on uh, reflective practice facilitator training. And that is a bit of a mouthful. When we <laughs> talked about this, I was thinking, do we have like a one word to sum it all up? And, and there isn't really a word. So the conversation today is just to help unpack a little bit about what all of that means so that people have a better understanding of what the course involves and whether it's right for them. Um, so just before we start, I want to just give a context, which is this training program is part of a wider program that Wahoon is running called How You Doing? Sit My Mind. We did the first pilot of that uh, a year and a half ago, two years ago. Um, and we ran uh, lots of different artist well-being strands. This program that we're doing at the moment includes some of that and we have some new elements as well. So we're still running the creative reflective practice for artists, which you, uh, Alison, run with Jane and Kai Thomas as well. Um, so we have that in Welsh and English. And that's where any participatory artists who are working in mental health settings or with communities who are more likely to have mental health issues are eligible to sign up for these very, very low cost, either one to one sessions or group sessions that are around reflective practice. As part of that, though, Wahoon was keen to think, well, longer term, how can we upskill people to be able to begin to offer reflective practice themselves, which is what led to the conversation with you and, and then you developing a two day course, um, which we're going to run to train people how, in how to do reflective practice. So my first question is, can you explain what is reflective practice? Mm. Yeah, thanks, Tracy. Um, so the first thing that comes to mind for me, really, perhaps as a way into people thinking about whether this might be right for them, is that I see reflective practice more as a way of being than something that we do, you know? Um, so in a way, um, developing... Um, the, the skills, the, the ways of thinking um, and, and being in a group that might facilitate reflective practice. That's that's kind of what, what we'll be looking at in the training. And really, you know, reflective, reflecting on our work, um, lots of research and, uh, and learning kind of backs this up, tends to deepen our enjoyment of our work so being able to kind of feel really connected to what what we do to maybe unpick a little bit like why we do why we work in the way that we do why we're drawn to certain groups or individuals um so it's a way of understanding i guess ourselves a little bit more in relation to the work um through through reflecting so you know through thinking a little bit more deeply looking at things from different perspectives and angles um and one of the um phrases that i find really helpful around reflective practice is um it is in letting go that we find our direction um and i think in a way that sort of captures um how how I work, you know, in terms of reflective practice and how the training will, will, will be delivered, because there won't be um, a really clear sort of, you know, these are the outcomes, these are the, this is our structure, although there will be a loose structure. It's very much about creating the atmosphere and the conditions where people feel sort of safe enough to relax, let go, and reflect together uh, deeply on their work. It's, that was a really long answer, sorry. It's <laughs> I don't apologize. I, like I'm just going, it's so rich, isn't it? When we can just, and also what I hear is that it's not just an individual practice, that there's a group practice. So I'm letting go, everyone's letting go. And between us also, the direction is coming between us and, uh, you know, together it's collaborative, collective, something like that. Absolutely. And I know that's part of the reason you and I were keen to to kind of make this happen is that collective, collaborative um, sort of um, 
I was going to say solution, but that's not the right word, really, but offering, I guess, um, because, you know, I know we both share um, a passion for finding ways to support arts practitioners, you know, in the work that they do. And one of the things we, you know, we know that reflecting and having a, a space to think about our work helps. We also know that everywhere, you know, money is tight. There's, there aren't enough opportunities for, you know, for everyone to ideally have like a paid reflective practice or supervision. So I think something about this idea about, you know, really widening the pool of practitioners in Wales who who can offer this and create this collaborative space for other arts practitioners is brilliant because it's you know it's going to make it more accessible and um affordable um so yeah yeah definitely collaborative I love that as well that more and more people who are trained to do it and more and more people then supported to do it actually changes the culture of how we work as practitioners so if we're all considering uh, reflection and reflectivity as part of what we do giving time for it giving space for it in in every project it it changes every project so it really changes our working practices very broadly then yeah yeah absolutely especially when you know as we know working as a whether you're a freelance artist or even if you're employed, say, in the NHS, for example, as an arts and health practitioner, it can be quite isolating. You know, it can be, it, you know, where if it's something, for example, that comes up in our work that isn't a crisis, you know, it's not a huge problem, perhaps, but it's something that's niggling at us. or we think, God, oh, you know, did I, did I, was there another way I could have, responded to that person in a session reflective practice offers a kind of space where it isn't about getting things right or wrong you know it really is just a space to to kind of say right this is what I'm finding can can we just explore it yeah beautiful um what about what experience do people need to have already before they sign up for this two-day training yeah sure so I think, yeah, it is, it, it is quite important that we're, we're clear that while this is in some ways an introductory training, I would say this is, you know, an introduction to becoming a reflective practice facilitator. It isn't an introduction to facilitation. Um, so, you know, I, I'll be assuming that everyone within the group already has quite a bit of experience and um confidence I guess in in being able to hold a group you know being confident in being the facilitator taking the lead um so I think I think that's definitely a requirement someone who who's got some substantial experience of of group work of facilitation um and also I think someone who perhaps you know one of the really important things someone who's curious someone who you know who's excited by opening up discussion reflective conversations you know and kind of um being with the unknown in a way I think that's a key part of reflective practice too that you know while it's absolutely not um a therapeutic intervention so there's no requirement that anybody would have you know any therapeutic training I think, you know, we do need to acknowledge that if you offer a reflective space for other practitioners and peers, some that there may well be an instance where somebody shares something that's on quite a vulnerable level or, you know, um, something really difficult in somebody's personal life may come into the, to the discussion on, on their professional practice. So I guess it's maybe a, a consideration for people who are thinking is this training for me is okay would I be comfortable holding a space where other people are being invited to be uh, to bring their their whole selves yeah great that's really clear um and does it matter what art forms people might be practicing in no, absolutely. I mean, this has been one of the wonderful things that I have found from running the creative reflective practice sessions. Um, sometimes, you know, we've if I or Jane 
we're working with, if we've offered a, a reflective exercise, um, some people have, have chosen to respond through writing. So perhaps we'd, you know, respond to that prompt or question through poetry or prose, others through visual um, art, drawing, and other people have perhaps just just experienced that in their body and just conveyed, you know, how, how that is for them. So, you know, definitely not a barrier. In fact, I would say um, that would just add to the richness of the of the group. One of the things we ask when people are signing up is that they are um, linked to an organization. And maybe I'll just say before we go on to more questions is the reason for that um, is that the course itself really is just about developing the skills for the facilitators. That's really the course. Yeah, We're funded, fortunately, by the Bering Foundation for this. And it's a two year project. So we'll, we'll hope to run the course again next year. And so as part of that, evaluating what we do is really important. So I started the conversation today saying this has come out of us running reflective practice sessions for artists and thinking long term, how is this sustainable? So now we've developed a training course to think, can we train more people yeah. to be able to do this? But for that to be able to be sustainable, we need to know what the impact is. And there are sort of three places, I think, where the impact is. One is when we run the training course, we'll know how the trainees are impacted. We can measure that. That's easy. Um, but then the skills that they learn and are going to bring out into the world, what difference could that make? And what difference would that make to other artists that they might run a session with and to the organizations who employ those artists what what organizational impact could this make and so within our um overall program we want to have a sense of what that is and um, one to help us improve it next year for example if trainees need a bit of additional support or mentoring or we want to know that so we can build it in next year and um, but crucially so that we know that this is is a good investment in you know we've got an idea we want to try it out and we want to say, does this work? Um, so we're asking individual uh, artists to be linked to an organization. So that could take lots of shapes. You might be an individual uh, employed by an arts organization or a health organization in some sort of creative role. So it may not even be called artist. It may be activity coordinator or something else like that. But your role is to run activities with groups, with, with people. Um, so that could be your role and your organization might want you to support that. There might be other activity uh, people in your organization that you could run those reflective practice groups with. Um, you might be a freelance artist working regularly with an arts organization and have a conversation with them. And really the only thing you need to ask them is if you're willing to pay for the training yourself or whether they will be willing to pay for the training for you. And if they would be willing for you to uh, try out one of your reflective practice sessions with their staff, if they employ other artists or invite other artists in, or maybe you've got a user group, someone who's employed, uh, who signed up for the course, for example, works a lot with volunteers on an arts project. And so they want to be able to use this with their volunteers as a way of offering something back to the volunteers who are giving their time. So there's lots of ways it might happen, but ultimately we just want an organization to be close to you. So you have somewhere to try it out. And then we get to measure what kind of impact that might have on the organization and those people. Hope that makes sense. In my head, that makes sense. <laughs> um, but that's the reason for the organization. If anyone's watching this and you still have another question about that, feel free to get in touch with me directly and I can I can help think that through creatively with you about how to make that work best. Um, so I have a couple of other questions. Um, Al. One is sort of the expectations people might have from a two day course. So if I go in at the far end, like if I do this two day course, Alison, will I be an expert in reflective practice? Um, OK, so sadly not. But the good news is I don't think any of us ever are. Um, you know, I feel like I've been 
working in, in, in reflective practice, you know, probably for about 20 years. And I wouldn't consider myself an expert, really. And for me, that's one of the joys of this work is that we're constantly growing, deepening, you know, learning more as we reflect more. Um, so, so maybe an expert not, but what you will have at the end of this two days, um, you will be equipped with um, the the sort of the framework. So the the you know you'll know how to set up, how to describe. That's a really important thing as well. I think you know for people, as you said, working in organisations to be able to go to their maybe managers or colleagues and say, okay, this is what I'm going to put together. This is what I'm going to offer. So um, people will know how to how to describe what they're offering, how to set up a group, how to structure the first few sessions. Um, and yeah, my hope is that because um, on the first day of the training, um, I will be inviting trainees to uh, to experience being a participant, really, you know, so so and I'll I'll lead that first session and then um, we'll unpick that. We'll, you know, we'll reflect on the session um, and then on the second day and then we'll look at it, you know, what what makes up reflective practice. And on the second day, people will have space to actually try out the skills themselves, have that experience of holding a small group. So my hope is that by the end of the the two day training, people have a you know a pretty good degree of right. I'm ready to go. I'm excited about this. I wanted to try it out. Um, and then we've got two sort of check in sessions, follow up sessions. Um, I think one is in May, isn't it? And maybe one in July. Um, well, what we're really hoping for those is that people will have begun to deliver reflective practice in their organizations so that we can use those check-in sessions as a kind of, right, how's it going? What are we noticing? What might you need a little bit more support with? Um, so acknowledging, I guess, that, you know, at the end of this two days, yes, my hope is people will feel I, I am ready to go and deliver reflective practice, but also holding the awareness that they're at the start of that journey and that, you know, hopefully there'll be lots more development in the future. Great. It's like the learning to drive, isn't it? Where we we learn the skills of something with enough confidence to get started and be safe enough. Yeah. Then it just, it's, you never get there. You're just constantly deepening because it's human beings we're working yes. with. Yes. Exactly. So it's always deeply. Something new is always going to happen when we work in a group with of human beings. And for me, that's my passion for facilitation is that it's never the same. It's always yeah. new. Absolutely. Absolutely. And hopefully, I think because we're hopefully going to have a group here of arts facilitators who are already pretty experienced, you know, just thinking whatever your art form, running a workshop, then you're always expecting the unexpected aren't you so I think people will will hopefully be familiar with that yeah brilliant um one of the things I was thinking is um people who are facilitating maybe arts workshops specifically in whatever art form and maybe I've been doing it for a year or two so I'm kind of getting confident and I have some regular groups that I run um if I did this course uh obviously I could then say I can offer this, I can offer reflective practice to any of the organizations I work for. So some people could go down that route. But how might people use some of those skills within their regular facilitation practice as well? Like, will there be transference across? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. I would say absolutely. I think, um, you know, the core skills I guess that we're going to be looking at here which is around listening deeply asking open curious questions um you know being with the group rather than leading the group from above all of those things are transferable to any facilitation setting um and I think having a reflective mindset you know 
definitely improves our practice as facilitators, whatever the context. Um, so I, I would I would very much hope that yes, the the learning and the experience from this training will help to strengthen people's practice in other areas too. Do you find that as a reflective practitioner yourself, does that also have personal benefits or impact the way you think in your uh, own life as well? Yeah, hugely, hugely. Um, you know, I think the the personal and the professional um, are rarely completely separate, especially when we're, you know, if we work in the arts, that we're kind of, we're, you know, we're not usually people who sort of... Um, clearly delineate those two worlds I would think I know that's a generalization but um but yes I you know I use reflection as a tool in my personal life through journaling writing um and definitely I think the two complement each other yeah and in that sense it's worth mentioning also because this is being evaluated this program by a brilliant creative evaluator, Jane Willis, um, who truly believes that also evaluation should be built into a project, not something just a kind of questionnaire at the end. Yeah. We've been working with Jane to find a very creative way to build in reflective notebooks through this training as well. So just like you say, journaling, Jane yeah. runs courses in journaling. So we've been thinking about how, yeah, how could we, how could that be embedded rather than feeling separate from the training? So we're hoping that we'll just add another layer of um, reflection to the process yeah. for people that will be useful. Yeah, and I think that's a wonderful addition. And I think what that does, if I'm right, we're going to ask people to do some of that before, I think, aren't we, before yeah. they attend. So... I think as well for people maybe who are contemplating, is this right for me? Maybe another question to ask yourself, you know, is are you in a time where you'd like to kind of grow, where you'd like to stretch yourself a little bit and, you know, on a personal and professional level, that might be a helpful consideration too. Yeah, brilliant. Um, I don't have any further questions. So unless there's anything else that we've kind of missed out from what we were going to share. Yeah. So the last thing to say is in initially when we talked about this, we were thinking in person and it would have been lovely to be in, in a room with people. You know, most facilitators prefer to be with the people. It's, you know, it's a lovely way for us to be as humans. However, it's not practical when we want to deliver a course that's Wales wide because it would have meant people traveling, accommodation, and it just becomes a little bit um, harder for access. So we're hoping that by being online so that the days are longer, but there'll be lots of breaks throughout um, yeah. and different ways of engaging online as well. So some more experiential, some more listening, some more conversational to, to just kind of keep that flow for people. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Tracy. Yeah, thank you.